Hey everybody, today we're talking about the inline keyword in C. Today's video is inspired by Adam who asked if I could do a brief video on the inline keyword in C, what it's for, how it works, and how it should be used, or can I recommend a good source for a clear explanation? I've been reading up on it, but I can't get a clear understanding myself. So I was thinking today we'd just do a quick little dive into the inline keyword and see, take a look around and see what it is, how it works and what it's good for. As always, source code for this video is available through Patreon. Thank you to all of you that support this channel, all of you subscribers, all of you that share these videos with your friends. Thank you for all your help. Thank you for supporting this work. Now let's get into the code. Now this example is going to be just a little bit exploratory. I haven't done a lot of prep beforehand to see what's going to happen. I just thought, let's just jump into it and try it out. But I did set up a few files and I just wanna take you through them really quick. So I've got this test.c. It's a very simple program that basically just takes in, so a simple program takes in an argument, one argument, presumably a numerical argument. It has another ret, return variable, whatever, you know, result variable. Um, let's change that to be result. I like that better than ret. The great thing about these exploratory type stuff is that I can change it up as we go. Okay, so I've got this and I have two fairly small functions here. Okay, so these, anytime you're talking about inlining things, we're talking about small functions. Typically, that's typically where we're going to see a difference. I also have two more files, nums.h and nums.c. Right now, they don't have anything in them. I just, I know I'm going to need them later on. And so I have them here just for when they come in handy. And then I have a make file. My make file is going to basically go through, this may look a little bit noisy to you. All it's gonna do is compile my test program using Clang, but it's going to compile it at different optimization levels. At the default optimization level, so no optimizations at 01 and 02. So that's basically what you're seeing right here. It's also compiling both the executable binaries in these different levels, but it's also generating assembly code. So you can see these are the dash S options. Now I recently did a video on assembly code why it's handy to learn assembly language in 2020. And I mentioned in that video that sometimes assembly comes in handy and today is that day. We're gonna talk about assembly. We're gonna use assembly to see what our compiler is generating. And of course in here you notice I am linking with nums.o, but like I mentioned before, this has currently no code in it. It's just an empty object file. So this isn't currently changing anything. I just wanted to have this in place because it's going to come in handy later on. We also have our clean target down here, which of course just blows everything away when we're done. Okay, so let's go back into test.c and just look at what we've got here. So one thing I wanna make clear in this video is that there is a difference between what it means to inline a function and the inline keyword in C. And that's what I wanna tease apart today. So inlining a function is simple. All it means is that rather than actually making the function call, we're going to take the code for the function and just stick it in line in the generated code. So we're not actually making a function call. We're not actually pushing anything on the stack. We're not actually returning a value. We're just inserting this code into the generated assembly code. Now, let's take a quick look and see what happens. In my example here, if I compile it, okay, you can see I've got a bunch of files and we should probably talk about what this is actually going to produce. If I run test zero, so this is, oh, whoops, forgot I need an argument and I didn't do any argument checking. So here our function is returning two up here. And then here, this is gonna take the maximum of whatever the function two returns and the argument. So let's do test three, we get three, test five, test one, we get two. Okay, so this is working the way we expect it to, no problems. And right now, if I run test one, and test two, I should get the same behaviors all the way around, nothing really changes. If we look at the assembly code, you're gonna see that things are a bit different. Now, I don't expect you to understand everything you're seeing here. This isn't a deep dive into assembly and what everything is doing. I just want to give you a rough idea of what you're seeing here. So the first thing you're seeing here are our functions. So here's the max function. It's gonna come down here to about here. So this is basically this function for our max code up there that takes two integers and decides which is greater of the two. And then down here, you have the two function. So this code basically just returns the number two. And then down here below you have main. So main 
basically is this whole thing down here. It's a lot of code for something that doesn't do very much, I know. But you also notice down here that we have some function calls that we're making, like our ATOI call here, our call to two, our call to max. So these function calls are actually happening. So right now they're not being inlined at all. Now, another thing to note is that we got about 86 lines of assembly code for this program. Now, if we look at our optimized versions, you're gonna notice that with 01, we are looking at 64 lines of assembly code. At 02, we're looking at 63 lines of assembly code. So about the same, not much difference there. Let's take a quick look at 01. And one thing you're gonna notice is the max function is still there. The two function is still there. But if we come down to main, you're going to notice that, that we're still calling max. So that function call is still there. But you notice that the call to two is gone. Basically, it's been replaced by this line right here. The compiler was smart enough to say, you know, this function always returns the same thing and it's a dumb function. It returns the number two. So why am I pushing stuff on the stack and actually calling this subroutine? Why don't I just stick two into the code? And that's exactly what's happening right here. And then if we jump over into op two, you notice again, we still have max, we still have two. So that code's still there in our binary. And if we look down at main, you can see that we're even doing a little more aggressive inlining here. We're basically, we still are calling ATOI, but now there's no max and there's no two because these are both really simple functions. And again, the compiler just realized, you know, I don't need to actually call these functions. I can just take the code from these functions and inject them into the generated assembly code, which makes things faster and it makes things smaller. And that's one thing that's interesting about this topic is that Compilers are funny machines. They run, they use a lot of different heuristics. There's also a lot of different semantics and policies in the different C standards. And so behaviors may also vary. Like if I switch to GCC, I may see slightly different behaviors because we're definitely getting into the part of the compiler world where things can vary a lot from one compiler to another. So this gives you a rough idea of what inlining is but you also might be thinking, you know, Jacob, you haven't actually written inline anywhere in your code. Neither of these, I, they're getting inlined by the optimization engine, but I didn't actually write inline anywhere. So let's inline a function and let's just say inline int two like this. So the way people typically think about inline is that inline is a hint. It's a, it's a hint to the compiler saying, hey, you should inline this. At least that's how we usually think about it. But let's see what really happens on my machine when I do this. If I compile my code, you notice now I get an error, which may seem a little weird. I just basically gave you a hint to inline this function. And one of the interesting things about hints is that hints, the compiler is under no obligation to actually take this hint, but would prefer if it would still compile my code. Now what's happening here is a little interesting. Is that inline has taken on a slightly different meaning. What this inline keyword is actually saying in this case is, hey, this is the alternative implementation of this function to use if you want to inline this function. Okay, so for this to work, there's basically two things I can do. First thing, I could make it static inline. Let's try that first. So static inline, we've talked about static before a little bit, is basically just saying, hey, this function only exists in this translation unit. So don't go looking for some alternative implementation of two. This is all you got. So if I make it static inline, now let's take a quick look at what we see here. So if we go into our unoptimized version, you notice we still have max, we still have main. Two got bumped down to the bottom, which is kind of fun. And then up here in main, did we call the function? Yes, so we're still calling the function. So I told it to inline it and it ignored this hint altogether. It just said, to heck with that. I'm not gonna inline your function. Thanks for the pointer, man. Not really doing it. But for some reason it did bump it down to the bottom, probably because this function is now static. And so maybe the compiler is organizing static functions down at the bottom. For whatever reason, this is just a good illustration of the fact that this is a hint. It's a hint. It's not actually forcing the compiler to do anything. And the compiler is definitely asserting its independence here. Okay, so what happens if instead, if I remove this static, let's say I don't want it to be static, but I actually want to use this alternate behavior. That's where this nums.h and nums.c are going to come into play. So for this to work, basically what we're going to do, and I just want to show you really quick how this works, is we need to have another function in another translation unit called two. Okay, so this is, the way you can think about this is that this is the official implementation. So let's say I have some 
I don't know, let's make a noticeably different implementation of two. Uh, let's have it actually print something out. Okay, and let's add some extra code in here. I'm just messing around here. There's nothing about this that's significant. I'm just creating basically a new version of two that actually returns 30. And the reason is just that I wanna be able to tell if it's calling one function or the other. So we have this module here, it's pretty simple, but all it's doing is it's replacing this two function. So now what you have is you have one translation unit, this nums.o that has one implementation of two, and you have test.c, which has its own version of two, and then I just wanna show you how this works when, it, when we actually compile. So now if I compile this down, now it doesn't give me an error anymore. Now it is willing to take just the inline int two. And what it's going to say is if the compiler decides to inline this two function, it's going to use this version. If it decides not to inline this function, it's going to use the original version. Okay, so let's first just try this out and see what happens. Let's pick a number between two and 30. If I run it with 01 and 02, everything is, it's calling the original, the broken version of two and it's returning 30. But you notice if I use the version that was optimized with 02, it is actually replacing it with my new implementation. So it's actually switched implementations of the function. And I guess this just gives you a little more flexibility in writing your code. So if there's an actual different implementation that's going to be more friendly to inlining, but maybe it's not quite as readable, Maybe it makes sense in your program to have two alternate implementations of the function. So I don't usually use this in my own programs, mostly because most things are fast enough. Often the compiler gets inlining right without me having to tell it to do anything. And I really don't like having multiple implementations of the same function because that makes my code hard to read and hard to understand and hard to maintain and it just opens up opportunities for bugs, which I'm usually trying to avoid at all costs but hopefully this gives you an idea of how the inline keyword actually works. But one thing I do hope you can see here is that just adding inline to this function didn't actually increase its likelihood of getting inlined, which is kind of annoying. Let's say we actually do want this to always be inlined. And we do have one option here I'm going to show you, and that is we can add an attribute to this function. I believe this works on both Clang and GCC. Oh, I need two. You know, I've never understood why you need the two parentheses. Uh, I need to dig into that one of these days. If anyone knows, please let me know down in the comments because that could save me a little bit of time. Appreciate it. But so what we're doing here is we're tagging this function and saying, hey, uh, no, I really mean it, always inline this function. People who use this a lot will sometimes pound to find this to be something like force inline or something like that. Today, I'm just gonna leave the attribute open so you can see everything that's going on here. But now if we compile it, you notice it still compiles just fine, but let's take a quick look at what's going on. So if we look at our assembly code, you notice we still have max, we still have main. Down here in main though, you notice that we have inlined this function. Okay, so at least Clang in this case is respecting the always inline attribute, even if it's not respecting my inline hint keyword. Now, if we jump over to our optimized level one version, you notice again, again, the function has been inlined. And if we jump over to optimization level two, once again, the function has been inlined. Now, interestingly enough, you notice that with this always inline thing, it didn't bother with that original version, that original broken version of two that returned 30. None of that happens anymore. Now it gets my version, my local version every time. Okay, now when would you be interested in using this always inline functionality? Like the only place where I typically use always inline is in some of my embedded code. So a few years ago, I was working on a library that was handling GPIO pins for an embedded microcontroller. Basically, I just wanted a generic general purpose library for managing inputs and outputs and toggling pins high and low. Pretty simple stuff. I was just trying to make my workflow and my code base a little easier to read. The problem I was running into is that optimizations were changing timing. A function call takes longer than an inline pin toggle and pin toggles are pretty simple. Not quite as simple as this two function, but they're pretty simple. So what was happening is code that would run just fine 
timing wise without optimizations was becoming much faster with optimizations. And that was actually breaking my system because timing matters in a lot of these systems. When you're, when you have a microcontroller that's talking to a radio or a sensor or some other component, sometimes timing being off by just a few microseconds can make the whole thing break. And so that was the problem I was running into. And so I definitely use this always inline attribute to say, look, just always inline the stupid thing because I need it to be consistent. In that case, I didn't really care if it was inlined or not. I just couldn't tolerate the variability that came from having it sometimes inlined and sometimes not inlined. Now, of course, the trade-off when you inline functions, you get faster code, but you also lose some debuggability. If you ever try to trace through this code, all of a sudden, GDB is gonna get a little confused about what it's seeing. Now, this isn't everything there is to know about the inline keyword or inlining functions, but I hope it's helpful. I hope it gives you a good idea of how inlining works and what the inline keyword actually does. Also, if you really care about inlining your functions, I hope this always inline attribute comes in handy. Just keep in mind that these things vary by C standard. They can also vary by compiler, but I hope this helps you understand what's going on. I also hope this helped you see what why assembly language can come in handy even in 2020. I always like to help you get under the hood because I think it helps you build a stronger foundation, which in the end is gonna make you a much stronger programmer. If you like this video, I've got others like these. Also subscribe to my channel if you don't wanna miss the next one. Remember source code is available through Patreon and until next time, I'll see you later.